Hey guys, Mike here from BorrowLenses.com. You know how they say nothing good ever happens after midnight? Well, I strongly disagree. While I spend my time as a video technician and a DP, I have a bit of a darker side. One shrouded and celestial mystery that only emerges at night. And yes, this is my dramatic cutaway angle. Eh, that's astrophotography. Very few images in any area of photography inspire as much awe as a well-executed image of the Milky Way. I've been doing this for years, and every time I'm out there, I'm fascinated by it. I have a constant itch for more. I stumbled onto this field with zero knowledge, and I promise you, I can do it, anybody can. It's not all about having high-end gear, rather planning your location and your timing of your shoot. So in this video, we'll cover the basics to get you shooting some amazing images of our galaxy, provided that is you can stay awake. So it is a little bit about the gear, and a tripod is a must. We'll be taking 15 to 25 second exposures, so you'll need that camera to be perfectly still. Exposure time is pretty important, and I find that 15 seconds, 25 seconds to be the sweet spot. Anything more than 25 seconds, and you run the risk of getting star trails, and that tends to make your night sky look more blurry. Anything less than 15 seconds, and I'm worried not letting enough light into your camera, which means you have to boost your eyes up. I'm always asked, what's the best camera for shooting the Milky Way? And the honest answer is, there is no best camera for shooting the Milky Way. There's always an advantage when you're shooting RAW because you'll have more digital information when you go into editing your images. It's more beneficial to shoot with a full frame camera compared to a crop sensor camera. As an experiment, I took a Canon crop sensor T7i and a Canon full frame 5D Mark IV to the same location, take similar images to see how they stack up against each other. As you can see, the T7i has the same amount of stars and different shades of color in the nebulous gas but there's more grain in the 5D Mark IV image. Now another topic of debate is lenses and which ones you should use. Now despite what some people and brands tote, there's really no perfect lens for anything. It's all about how you utilize it in certain situations. So when the Milky Way is at its peak, it expands across the whole sky. So like any form of photography while trying to capture a large area, you need a nice wide lens. I try to get something that has a lower f-stop. A lower f-stop means you can let more light into your camera, which gives you more flexibility with your ISO. Personally, I love the Canon 16-35mm 2.8 version 3. The reason I'm a big fan of this lens is because of the front glass element. It's flat. I tend to stay away from lenses that have a dome-shaped front element because those often catch unwanted glares from either me light painting, street lights, or headlights. It's important to pick gear that you're comfortable with. You'll be out shooting in a dark location. So if you're shooting with a camera you've never used before, it's gonna cause a lot of unwanted frustrations. If you have the time and you're shooting with new gear, mess around with it before you go out on location so you're comfortable with all the settings and where the buttons are located, so you're not messing around in the dark. So we have our gear selected, we have our settings dialed in, but none of that's actually gonna matter unless you planned out your shoot properly. So it's important to understand what you're actually able to capture before you get that crazy Milky Way shot in your head. And this is gonna date all the way back to science class in elementary school. Remember, the Earth is always moving. Therefore, so is in your view of the Milky Way depending on where you are in the planet. I'm located on the East Coast. Go Sox. So my Milky Way season is from April to September. Now, due to the tilt of the Earth and the rotation of our planet, in the winter months, I can only see the tail end of the galaxy and not the thick milky core, which is most photogenic. Now, tracking the galaxy can seem more difficult than it actually is. A helpful app I like to use is called Sky Guide. You can reference any location on the globe at any time of day or night and see what portion of the sky is visible. Next, you want to think about location even further, specifically in regards to the true enemy of astrophotography, light pollution. That's the brightening of the night sky by street lights, city lights, cars, and so much more. I like to travel to more remote locations to avoid any light pollution. A guide that I live by is a light pollution map. Here, you can see all the bright spots surrounded by cities and all the dark spots that are frankly in the middle of nowhere, but are the more ideal locations to shoot. Even if you travel all this way, it's tough to avoid the number one culprit of light pollution, the moon. Here's a time lapse to show the night sky before the moon rises and what happens to the sky as the moon breaks the horizon. You can see here how the bright moon rises and starts blotting out a lot of the detail from the Milky Way. When planning a night of shooting, I tend to go around the new moon phase. That happens once a month. That's when the moon isn't hitting the sun at all, so there isn't a bright glowing rock reflecting in the sky. Now, 
your final planning step, I promise. It's pretty simple. Keep an eye on the weather. You need a nice clear night with no clouds that are not interrupting your exposures. So I'll be honest, there are so many different methods when it comes to astrophotography. And the main reasons I like to do single exposures the most is because of light painting. Light painting isn't crucial to capturing the night sky, but it adds a whole other level of creativity to your work. So for this example, I figured I'd use my beautiful long flamingos and pose them with the Milky Way and see what we can do. I'm gonna line my shot up with the galaxy and set the flamingos in the foreground. I fire my shutter and wave a quasar tube over our subject and turn the light off completely. As you can see, my timing is off and the flamingos are all blown out. So this time, instead of doing pass over with the light, I'm going to flash it in three different spots. Once you find the right timing with the light, you'll have an image like this. So there you have it, like a properly exposed light painted flamingo. Hopefully you have shed some light on the darkness and mystery that is astrophotography and dramatic cutaway angle. So plan out when and where you'll be shooting, keep an eye on the forecast and stay awake. Keep all those factors in mind and I think you'll have success with capturing the night sky. So if you want to learn more or try out some of the gear you saw in this video, head over to borrowlenses.com for all your photo and video needs.